Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? God, we thank you for this day, and we ask that your presence would be with us. God, that you would speak to us through your word, that your spirit would convict us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our God and King. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Today, uh, we are starting a new sermon series. Uh, essentially, what we're trying to do is we're going to ask, is this in the Bible? Because a lot of times uh, we think certain things are in the Bible, but they are not actually in the Bible. So here is a quiz. Is this in the Bible? Cleanliness is next to godliness. I don't know is a good answer. Yes or no? How many of you think, let's just do a quick poll. How many of you think it's in the Bible? There's no wrong answers, church. <laughs> no, but I just, Tom, thank you, Tom. Thank you. All right. He's taking one for the team. I'm sorry to say Tom has not read his Bible. <laughs> and I hear, I thought he was an upstanding man, Bible-believing man. <laughs> I wish this was in the Bible so that I can tell my kids it's in the Bible God godliness is next to cleanliness clean up your room <laughs> right oh my goodness I just want you to think about a recent history that we as a as a faith community went through uh, some of you might remember some of you might be trying hard to forget something called a pandemic happened you all remember that all right you know how much money, uh, how many cleaning supplies were in your house during that season? How many of you had like jars of hand sanitizers, right? Aerosol cans. We as a church, we bought a fog machine that we would like walk around and try to kill bacteria that was left. Like we did crazy things. Like honestly, like thinking about it. And at the preschool, right? Like every day, Brian would like, you know, clean it. Like, you could literally eat off the floors. It was that clean, right? Here's another question. Do you know how much money we as a country spent on cleaning supplies last year? All right, you have to give me a number, church. Come on. Two million. Two million? Okay. Anybody else? Two billion. Two billion? Wow. Two million. <laughs> Two billion. Wow. Anybody going higher than that? Lower than that? 45 billion. Again, Tom is wrong. <laughs> I set him up and he's still wrong. We spent $20 billion last year. $20 billion on cleaning products, right? And there was an interesting survey done uh, as well uh, that older uh, people in their 55 and 65 actually spend a lot more money on cleaning supplies than young people. It was an interesting thing. And the more I thought about it, it kind of makes sense. Because when Kristen and I were dating, um, uh, we both, I used to live in Pittsburgh and Kristen lived in Downingtown, Philadelphia area. And we were dating long distance and our brother lived um, in Pittsburgh as well. So we would see each other over the weekends. And whenever Kristen came down, she was really good at this. She would slowly kind of change the topic to say, why don't we just watch a movie at my brother's? You know, they were like, this was happening quite a bit. Like, we were never hanging out at my apartment. I had, a I had two other roommates. And you all know where this is going, right? <laughs> and this is how clueless I was. I, I said to her, I was like, I don't understand. Why are we always hanging out at your brother's? And she goes, your apartment stinks. <laughs> We had two, we had three pr cleaning products, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, we had uh, soap to wash our dishes, we had a toilet cleaner, and a soap to wash our hands next to the sink. That was it. <laughs> no wonder Kristen, I mean, she still went out with me, so. Anyway, her better judgment, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> so, right, like, that's where we are. Like, we, we spend so much time and energy in cleaning our houses. Uh, we have products to clean the counters. We have products to clean the glass. We have stuff that, you know, that we spray in the air when we cook fish, uh, right? Like, you know, we do all these things. <clears throat> Cleanliness is next to godliness.
us as a culture, right? Like we're kind of obsessed with that. And one of the ways to look at what really matters is to look at how much we spend, right? Where, where do we spend as a culture, as a community? And here it is, right? It's a lot of money that we have spent on this. But today's scripture talks about a different kind of cleanliness. Here are some harsh words uh, uh, that I want us to read. Uh, these are not warm and fuzzy words, but these are actually hard words. Um, Matthew 23 to 25. Oh, to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean. Verse 27, O to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you are like full of bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy. And wickedness. Oh, do you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous. And you say, if we lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourself that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Go ahead then. And complete what your ancestors started. I doubt there's a, wall, a hallmark greeting card with these words on it. Right? It's pretty, pretty blunt. That Jesus is calling out these Pharisees. I want to give you a little bit of background as to why Jesus is talking about this. First, it's about identity. <clears throat> The God of the Old Testament, the God who called Abraham, the God who was seen to Moses, the God who called the people of Israel, made them a nation, the God who promised them, um, who made a covenant with them. This God, this living God said these words in Leviticus 19 to be holy because I am the Lord, your God. I am holy. Be holy. Because I, the Lord your God, I am holy. What does holy mean? Be holy. Because I am the Lord God who is holy. Here, the Israel's entire identity, the nation's entire identity was about being set apart. It's about being different. The entire Old Testament, you read, they were called to be a different people. They were called to be the light in the world. They were called to be, they were, they were supposed to show uniqueness in how they acted. They were supposed to follow the laws of the Lord that God had given them so that those around them would see them and know that they are set apart. They were supposed to uh, not kill. By doing so, by not committing murder, they knew that they were different from their neighbors. They were told not to commit adultery or steal. This was all about their identity. They were supposed to be different. These laws were given so that their identity was holy. Because God said, I am holy. Be holy. So that's the background. That, that's where the starting point is. It's about identity. So there were a group of individuals who kind of formed a club, and they were called the Pharisees. And if you read the New Testament, Jesus is pretty hard about the Pharisees. But actually, the reason, the whole reason these Pharisees were created was to precisely do what I just talked about. What the Pharisees started to do is they kind of came together and they said, Hey, our nation is not following what God told us to do. Our nation has not following the moral law that God has give, given us. We're all acting like everybody else. So these people kind of got together and they started to read uh, the Holy Scriptures. They started to read the Old Testament. And they 
began to understand it and they started to say, you know what, we need to follow this. We need to follow the moral law. We need to follow the civil laws and the ceremonial laws. We need to keep these laws. We are called to be separate. But also, they were, they took it to a little extreme as well. They started interpreting what it means to give our tithes to God. In the Old Testament, it said that we have to give 10% of all that we earn to the synagogue or the temple for worship. They started to look at that and they said, you know what? We should also give 10% of the herbs that grow in our backyard. The mint leaves that we cut. 10% of that needs to be put away. They started to make extreme things. And the Ten Commandments where it says, honor your mother and father, they didn't like it. So they kind of came up a way around it as to how to get out of it. It was called Corbin. If someone said, I give my life to God, if they declared that they gave their life to God, that meant because God is the ultimate father, so they didn't have to care or listen to their earthly parents. And they had their own way of looking at ceremonial laws as well. And these, all these laws were based on their, these new laws the Pharisees created were based on their interpretation. They all kind of came together, read the scriptures, and came. But then they did something else as well. They started to look down on people who didn't do what they were telling them to do. So if you didn't take 10% of the mint that grew in your backyard and bring it to the temple, they judged you. They started to judge those who didn't follow exactly what the law was telling them. And Jesus was extremely hostile to them. In Sermon on the Mount, um, when we read about the script, what Jesus said, this is how you need to do things. There were three things that Jesus focused on in, on the Sermon on the Mount. It was about inward piety, not pretense or being good on the outside. It was all about being good on the inside. He, Jesus talked about prayer. Because when these Pharisees prayed, they would stop in the middle of the street and make these elaborate prayers. So that everybody could hear that they were praying. And then, and then when it came time to giving to the needy or the poor, it was a show. They would make a big gesture to tell everybody how generous they were. And Jesus said, no, don't do that. Jesus said, when you pray, go and close the doors. Pray so that your Father in heaven can hear you. Not for others to hear. And when you give, don't make a big grand gesture about your mint. Let not your right hand know what your left hand is giving. Give with an inner attitude that all that you have is from God. Not as a show off. When it came to fasting, they would make a big deal. They would wear ashes on their heads and they would wear sackcloths and tell everybody by their outward appearances that they were fasting. But Jesus said, no, don't do that. It's the inward piety that counts. It's the inward things that count. And Jesus called them, you whitewashed tombs. This actually... Um, the reason Jesus is using this um, is because they, during the Passover time, there was actually all these people from all over the world. We celebrated Passover a couple of weeks ago when we read through the stories of Jesus' crucifixion, betrayal, crucifixion, and resurrection. Like that was during the time of Passover. So people from all over the known world would come to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there was this thing where they would actually paint, put new paint on the graves of those who died. They would actually paint them. That's called whitewashing it. And Jesus is calling these individuals whitewashed tombs. Because on the outside, they were looking great. But on the inside, they were unclean on the inside. He said, you who killed prophets, you think you're set apart, that word holy. But you're just like everyone else, filled with sin. Is what Jesus said to the Pharisees. So this morning the question to us is. Who is Jesus speaking to today? Hear these words again. Oh to you teachers of the Bible. 
you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. First clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and the outside will be clean. Oh, do you teachers of the Bible, you hypocrites, you're like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside you're full of bones, dead to everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be people as righteous, but on the inside you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. See, one of the challenges that we face when we read scriptures like this is it's really easy for us to read the scripture and identify who the Pharisees are in our world. Who those people are. It's easy to do that. But who is Jesus speaking to? Today? I want to bring this home a little bit by telling another story. By reading another story. Where inside and outside are compared. And I hope the Spirit of God convicts us as we read this story that Jesus told. It comes to us from Luke chapter 18. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And here Jesus is talking. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me. I am a sinner. Jesus goes on to say, verse 14, I tell you that this man, rather than the other man, this man being the tax collector, I tell you, this man, I tell you, this tax collector and not the Pharisee went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Here are the true prayers. One of the Pharisee, one of the tax collector. Back in those days, in Jesus' days, it was not quite evident whose prayer was accepted. But now we know whose prayer was expected. Friends, who is the scripture speaking to this morning? I think the scripture is speaking to me and to you. That we enter God's presence with humility, model after what the tax collector did. That we go before God in repentance. Saying that we are unworthy to be in God's presence. We enter God's presence knowing that. We enter God's presence saying that we are sinful. For we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That we are called to be clean on the inside. We are called to be clean on the inside. It's not the outward appearance. It's on the inside. Is what matters. I hope you can comprehend. That God is calling each one of us. To be set apart. To be holy. Let us focus on our inward piety. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your word. Words that are hard at times. God, we ask that you would uh, speak to us. God, you would give us the courage to be holy on the inside. And you would give me the courage. be set apart like you. We ask all these things in your name. Amen.